lifts up your gaze, be lifted up. Tell everyone how great the love, the love come down from heaven's gate to kiss the earth with hope and grace. Come on, sing it. We sing. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong. Your hands be lifted up, come on. Lift up your hands, be lifted up. Let the redeemed declare the love. And we bow down in heaven's gate. We kiss the feet of hope and grace. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong. Our family has had a very significant time of gathering over these last couple of days. Yesterday, primarily being a time when family has come in from Chicago. Of course, we came in from South Carolina. And Tiff and Robert came down from Angel's Camp uh, with their children. And it's been an unusual time. It took Barbara's passing to get us all together in one place. But we spent the day yesterday remembering, reflecting, and talking about one person's life, their story, and the more we talked about it, and the more we got into it, the more we discovered there was in it. Barbara's story was unique. And as we got into it and we started celebrating things, laughing a lot, uh, some tears also, but what struck me once again is how significant and important each person's story is. No person's story is exactly like or quite like another person's story. There are things and components and contributions, encounters, things that have gone on in a person's life that makes up their story. 
And when God, our Heavenly Father, entered into this world through the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, he stepped into not just the corporate story, the world story, but he stepped into the uniqueness of each individual story. And I want you to think about that in the light of the fact that you have a story and it's unique. And there's things that I don't know about most of your stories that had we the time, I would love to hear about. Because you would see the wonders of God at work in each of your stories and how you are uniquely made. I'd like to take a few moments and reflect further on unique stories because everyone that is in scripture, everyone that's in the Bible, the stories that we read about are individual stories about people. The one I'm going to read to you is from Mark 7. I'm going to read, reflect on a couple of them. And um, you, can, you need not turn to it. You could listen. Uh, Jesus left the place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, and by emphasis, not a Jew. Born in Syrian Phoenicia, that made her a Syro-Phoenician. And she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Jesus responds by saying, first let the children eat all they want. That's what he told her. This one person in her story who has a daughter who is vexed and troubled by an evil spirit. A concept which is not altogether popular in this day, but I'm telling you that's what the scripture says. And she said, after being put off, it's like, it's not right to take the food for the children and throw it to the dogs, which was essentially calling her a dog. You're like the dog. Why should you be getting this? Now, in our day and time, that'd be pretty offensive. In fact, you might be subject to litigation. Uh, you could be brought before the courts for dismissing somebody as a dog. You're not as good as me. You're not as good as the Israelites. But she said, yes, Lord, she replied, agreed with him, didn't dispute him, but said, but even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs of the children. You know, what humility that she didn't get offended, she didn't get in a huff, she didn't start demanding a right, she didn't start thinking about how uh, that had denigrated her and leave in a huff. She said, yeah, but even the dogs under the table get the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. Faith expressed through humility. 
That's one story. That's just one story about one person. We don't have any record of Jesus saying that to anybody else. There's something about the uniqueness of the way Jesus enters into each of our stories. And continuing on in the same chapter, which is uh, Mark 7, if you want to check up on me later. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. And there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak. He probably could hardly speak because he was deaf. He couldn't audibly hear, and so he... I'm not going to try to impersonate what I think he sounded like, but uh, he was very limited in his ability to speak. And there were some people who brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, and Jesus has a way of doing that. Jesus doesn't have a desire to make a scene of your life and your story in front of other people. He took the man aside, and after he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. You done that lately, Kevin? <laughs> After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit. I will always wonder, what does that look like? What, what does it mean that he spit? and touch the man's tongue. That wouldn't go over with the CDC, would it? <laughs> he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be open. At this the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. One story, a single story. We don't have an account of Jesus doing that again with anybody. Jesus entering this man's story, meeting him where he was in a unique and creative way. I got one more spit story. <laughs> from John 9, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, this is so like people, who, who sinned? The assumption was that this person's condition was a result of their sinfulness. Who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. Somebody else's fault. Either you were a bad person or you were raised in a home by bad parents. But the reason you're messed up, the reason you can't see is because of something that somebody's done. 
Listen to Jesus' response. Neither this man nor his parents sin, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life or in his story. Having said this, he spit on the ground. And I conclude this must have been a good-sized loogie. <laughs> he spit on the ground and made some mud, which requires a bit of juice. made mud with a saliva. Can you picture this? Let's just slow down a little bit. I want you to picture this. You know, it, this wasn't a one second deal. I mean, this took a little doing. You spit on the ground, you mix it all up, you make mud. It takes a little doing. I, and I'm wondering if people are going, He made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Have you done that lately, Kevin? I was thinking, you know, we're looking at spit stories. And I thought if, if more of that went on around here at Saddleback Covenant, is uh, the word would get out, hey, you ought to go over to Saddleback Covenant on Sunday morning. They'll spit on you there. <laughs> you could change the name to the Church of the Abundant Spit. <laughs> and then he said to the man, wash in the pool of Siloam, this means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Another story, an individual story, and we don't see that recorded any other place. Part of the human think is if you do something and it's extraordinary, then you need to do it again. And you need to become the church that does it. The first church of spit in Mission Viejo. And all of a sudden we develop methodologies and techniques that everybody does. Because it was done and it worked and it was good, and the outcome was positive. And so therefore, we need to repeat that and keep doing that, even if it doesn't work. You know, sometimes we try to repeat things, and, and we're, and then we're out of spit. We don't have any spit left. And say, well, I'll just take some dirt and I'll put it on. And it, and it doesn't work. We, we try to repeat what Jesus does when he enters into one person's story and he does something that is unique to them, that is unique to you, that's not like anybody else. The Gospels are full of these kinds of stories, individual stories personal stories about how Jesus engaged people. And they were unique and personal each and every time. 
one final story. You've heard me over the years, somewhere along the line, uh, teach out of John 3 and Jesus encountered with a woman at the well. It's a unique story. It's a one-of-a-kind story. Jesus is go, he's tired, stops at the well to get some water, and he's thirsty. He sent the boys into town to Costco to get some provisions and so they could continue on their journey, and he's there. And this woman comes in the middle of the day, which is not when the noble women come. They come early in the morning when it's cool. This woman, who had been through five husbands, tough lady, comes to the pool and he says, would you get me some water? He made a request of her, which dignified her life by proposing that she had something to offer him that would make a difference to him. Catch that, it could get by you quick. He didn't start off by telling her something. He didn't prophesy to her. He didn't try to fix her. And he didn't tell her to be someplace she wasn't. You with me? He asked her to do something for him. Dignified her life by asking her to do something for him. Try that sometime. We're so accustomed to being armed and ready to tell people something. Find out what happens if you ask them something, especially if you convey worth to them by asking them to do something for you. And then you know the rest of the, the story. They engage in this conversation. She starts calling him a Jew. Then she calls him Lord. And then he proceeds to tell her about the five husbands that she's had. Bye. And then she says, hmm, I see you're a prophet. So there's this unfolding of the person of Jesus and her understanding of who he really was in her story. We have no other account in all of Scripture of this event that we read and that we consider. And the disciples are so funny. They come back and they see Jesus hanging out with this woman of ill repute and having a conversation with her. And they get in a little huddle over by themselves and they say, you know, he's the leader, but what is he doing here? What is he up to? What is he after? Now, some of your imaginations are taken off, but I think that's what they were questioning his motives and his intentions. She goes back to the village and says, you know what? I just met somebody that told me everything about me. And sort of just telling her story. That's all she was doing was just relating her story. And they knew who she was. She lived in that village with them. They knew that she'd been through five husbands and, and the women didn't want their men hanging out around her with her because they might become number six. But they listened to her story and they went to where Jesus was, and Jesus is there, and he's sharing the kingdom. He's teaching the kingdom. And they said, you know what? We believe because of her story, the power of a story. He believed because of her story. They believed. He said, but now we have heard for ourselves and not only do we believe because of her story, now that we know you are the Christ. Through that woman's story, as irregular, and if you want to say, 
messed up, affected, maybe lots of things to be ashamed of. But Jesus got right in the middle of her story and in the middle of her stuff. And the result of it was through that woman and her story, a whole village came to know who Jesus was and to confess him as the Christ. Never discount the impact and the value of your story. And I know, I know what it's like to listen to somebody else's story and then think my story isn't as good as their story. And besides that, if people find out about my story and the things that are in my story, they're not going to think very much of me. They won't invite me back. This will be the last time I speak at this church if I really tell my story. But everybody's got a story. When Jesus talked about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, there's not a person here that wakes up on any given morning and doesn't fall short of the Sermon on the Mount by breakfast. And there's not a person here who is unacquainted with stupid pills. I have another affectionate name for them, but I will spare you, lest I offend you. They're dumb pills. And I've taken a sufficient quantity of those in my life. But it's part of the story. It's part of my story. And it's part of how Jesus steps into my story and redeems and works. And neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this has happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. Our failures, our fumblings, our stumblings become occasions for the work of God to be displayed in our lives. Hear me. Some of you here this morning don't like your story. You wish your story was like somebody else's. But your story is your story. And Jesus comes into your story in a way that he doesn't come into anybody else's story. And he does things in your life and in your story that are unique to you. And by the way, when he comes in and does something unique, don't put it on somebody else. This is what I did. I, I put my finger in my right ear and I, I, I spit and touched my nose and my ear opened right up. Because then the next thing you know, you got people walking around. Them. Jesus is creative and unique in every way he encounters each one of us. Now you say, how can he do that with millions of people? That is a wonderful Savior. That is a marvelous Savior. That is an incredible Redeemer. Because that is how big Jesus is. We could go back and start singing and shout your praise. We could start getting into another place on this thing when we, you know what to magnify the Lord means? Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You know what to, to magnify the name of the Lord means? It's like a magnifying glass. When you take a magnifying glass 
and you look at things through the magnifying glass, what, what happens? You see things bigger. So that's what it means to magnify the Lord is when we look at the Lord in such a way that he becomes bigger and larger than what we had previously acknowledged. That's how big Jesus is. John, he comes right into your life and you could tell the stories about how he's met you, how he's done things for you in a way that's so unique that sometimes you wonder if you should even try to explain it because you know the people around you may not understand it. I sat next to Robert uh, last evening and we were talking about his visit to the Vatican and he got into this story. He was telling me this story about, I, I think you were thirsty. He was thirsty and he, you know, they were there and waiting for the Pope to come through and in proximity to, and, and, and he just prayed. And he looked down at, at his feet, and there was a liter of water that wasn't there before. Right? Am I telling your story right? The, do what? A liter of water. What was the last thing he said? Oh, it hit him in the chest. The liter of water hit you. And I thought, whoa. That hadn't happened to me lately. <laughs> but I was listening to him tell his story, and I thought, wow, that's his story about how the Lord met him. And you know what? I, Robert, I was encouraged by that. It encouraged me to ask the Lord for simple things and basic things. That's his story. And his, his story impacted me. Um, most of my messages, I can only put commas on. I, I can't find periods or exclamation points that brings it to an absolute, compelling, dramatic, powerful finish that leaves people going out the door and say, that is the best message I have ever heard in my entire life. I've never figured out how to do that. And, and at 80, I'm going to quit trying. Let me do this. I'm going to leave you with just a couple of thoughts that I hope you will carry away and you will embody and live out because if you do, I believe it will change the way you relate to people. First thing I'd like for you to do and Matt, don't turn to Heather. <laughs> turn to somebody and say, you have a very unique story. Open your mouth, talk, speak. That's true, Wes. Unique story. And remember this. When you've met one person and you've heard their story, remember that you've met just one person and you've heard their story. It's like no other story. And when you engage someone else, you're going to get into their story and it's going to be very unique to them. You don't know where people have been. And you don't know what things have affected them. You, you don't know what voices have attempted to shape them or what stereotypes have put pressure on people to be somebody that they're not. You don't know any of that. You don't know their experiences. You're not called there to fix them. You're not called into their story to ask them to be someplace they're not. You with me? I hope that takes the pressure off of somebody. 
because we feel under pressure to help people get to some place they're not. And if we engage, engage people where they are and enter their story and listen and celebrate their gifts and celebrate wherever you can see God is at work. You're not telling them to be where they're not. You're not trying to fix them. You know, people have a pretty good sense of when you're trying to fix them. They also know when you're listening at this level. And if you're authentically, genuinely interested in hearing about their story. And when most people sense that that's where you're coming from, and that you recognize that they're uniquely made, uniquely wired, and you're interested in finding out about that, I'll tell you what it's like. It's a kind of a graphic picture. If I leave this with you, you might remember, you won't remember me, but you might remember this. It's like initially when you engage people, it's like coming up on a castle moat and you look up and somebody's up there on the high bulwarks of the castle and the drawbridge is up. And initially it's like you're saying, hello up there. Hello up there. How's it going? None of your business. Ah, just thought, thought I'd check in, see how you're doing. Well, it's actually kind of hot, 100 degrees a day. And you persist in showing interest in their story and what's going on around their story, then what can happen, and it's a beautiful thing when it does, you see the drawbridge begin to come down. Oh, don't be too quick. Don't charge in. Don't stand there saying, Woo, let me go. Have I got a verse for you? <laughs> you wait till you're invited in. Come on in. Until you're invited to the table to break bread. But that begins by getting interested in the person that's up on the wall behind the walls. Ooh, it is so tempting to take off on that, on the subject of walls. It'll cost you to love the way that Jesus loved. It, is, well, it's, it, might, it might cost you a cup of coffee. It might cost you a meal. But one thing I know it will cost you is time. Because you can't what is the, what's the term you used, Matt, at ACM last year on community? You can't, you can't what? Cram. You can't cram community. Well, you can't cram relationships. And you can't cram getting into people's story. It takes time and it takes an investment of yourself to be able to do that. But that's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus does. And he is investing in your story right now, this morning. And inviting you into the journey of getting into other people's story. And seeing what he does. And be prepared for it being unique and personal. And I don't know if he will ask you to spit on somebody's tongue.
I've never done that. But I think we need to be prepared for Jesus to do something that is off the wall and unique and creative. His invitation to us is to step into the creatorial dimension of how he works in people's lives. And open up your heart and open up your brain and that you might feel the prompting of the Lord to do something highly irregular. Only to discover it's exactly what they need. So my final thought, and that means absolutely nothing. I've learned that. When people say finally, or in conclusion, now, as I close, that means that we're trying to find a way to exit. Make it your heart's purpose to pay attention to other people's story. And I promise you, the more you get into it, the more you will see the wonders of that person and the way God has worked in their lives. As we sat around the fire pit last night celebrating Cooper's mom, Tiffany's mom, Sue's sister, Leanne's sister, the more we talked, the more things would bubble up to the surface. And the more things that people would laugh about and celebrate, and at the end of the evening, you were left with the impression, wow, what a story. What a person. Everybody you meet has that kind of story and that kind of discovery to be realized. So let's be like Jesus and get into the other people's stories and find out where God is at work. God of the family.